This is a teaching session I gave to the 58 Society in the Merseyside region on general uh, aspects of ankle fractures. It doesn't include syndesmosis or posterior malleolar fractures, although both these videos can be found on the Liverpool Foot and Ankle channel. I hope you enjoy. Welcome everyone. So those who don't know me, uh, my name is Lyndon Mason. I am one of the foot and ankle stroke trauma, stroke major trauma surgeons at uh, Aintree and the other Liverpool University Hospital uh, hospitals and my remit today was ankle fracture so as ankle fractures in itself as a topic is uh, more than just this talk uh, so I'm going to concentrate specifically on the basics of ankle fractures for this covering uh, all the literature and everything that you could hopefully ever want for your FLCS. Okay so I'm going to go through the anatomy the diagnosis, the treatment, and then the post-surgical elements. The anatomy, I'm gonna go through the joint ligaments and stability. So first, the joint. So uh, this um, picture on the left-hand side is from the work uh, done by those in uh, uh, the Barcelona Anatomy Group. Uh, it's uh, quite a few papers that they've uh, put out, and I will go through some of these uh, coming shortly. But basically, you have the tailor dome. Tailor dome is a bit of a saddle shape. It's wider at the front and narrower at the back. You also have the lateral tailor process and the medial process. And the lateral and medial take about 10% of the weight when the majority weight is taken over the tailor dome. Inferior surface of the talus, you then have the posterior facet, as you can see here. The medial and anterior facet, and then the navicular quite clearly seen in uh, this other cataract photo. We've kept in the acetabular pedis here, which is your navicular, the uh, spring ligament, which has an articular facet in it, like a meniscus, like in your knee, exactly the same type of tissue. And then the, this then uh, continues to send down to the uh, sustentaculum uh, to form your spring ligament. Okay, so the other ligaments of the ankle. Uh, if anyone wants to read this further, it's a beautiful paper by um, the Van Dyke group, but the majority of them are actually from the Barcelona group. So this is your lateral ligaments. Uh, most of you should already know with your ATFL and CFL, so anterior tibial fibular ligament and calcaneal fibular ligament, and also the anterior inferior tibial fibular ligament. The posterior uh, tibial fibular ligament is not witnessed here, but we'll go into that now. One thing that some of you might not know is that where your CFL inserts, there's also another band that comes off this uh, lateral confluence of the CFL. And what's important about this is actually when you are going from uh, plantar flexion to dorsal flexion, your ATFL becomes slack, but this lateral confluence actually remains tight all the way through range of motion, which is quite important. And you also have this uh, posterior. Uh, tailor fibular ligament. You can see here. This is actually on the uh, undersurface of the fibula, rather than the uh, on top of the fibula, like the other two ligaments. And actually, if you take it off, it, it does actually continue straight onto your ATFL. So your ATFL and PTFL really are the same confluent ligament. And where it inserts is on uh, this uh, lateral facet of your talus. This is one of my cadaveric papers. You can see I've taken off ATFL and CFL, and you can see that it prevents rotation. On the medial side, you have the spring ligament. You also have other ligaments inserted into the spring ligament that come, all come off the sustenial and this is the superficial deltoid. And they all are together. And then you have the uh, deep posterior deltoid, which go into the importance of that later. But just so you could note that the superficial deltoid is attached to your calcaneum, not your talus. And again, I'll go into the importance of that later on. This is a, uh, a cataract picture of that from the uh, pictorial assay of uh, the ligaments of the ankle. And you can see it does blend all into one another. And then you have uh, bits which are a little bit thicker, which is what we've called these ligaments. Stability wise, so this is from the AO principles. What is a stable ankle fracture? Fractures involving two breaks of the ring, and then how to uh, assess the two, uh, two breaks, so the two fractures, delta rupture. 
this is only one element of stability, and I uh, beg you to not keep it to just this. Uh, this is an example where we have a anterior tibial uh, rim fracture and rupture of your uh, lateral ligaments, and you can see that this is anteriorly unstable and has got absolutely nothing to do with the ring, as we've just discussed. This has been fixed by a lateral ligament uh, reconstruction and uh, a screw to fix back that anterior rim and as then uh, maintain stability. So I wrote this paper a little bit earlier this year, got published in January on ankle stability and ankle fractures. And if you can take anything from this, is a, there's a lot in this paper. And if you want to know about stability, then I read this paper. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. But you can see that you have a range of motion and stability both in your sagittal plane, coronal plane, and axial planes. So, in general, the definition of ankle instability is an ankle joint itself is displaced or can be displaced if subjected to normal forces. Um, so, for example, in your sagittal plane and uh, translation and rotation, is a different structures that uh, maintain your stability. So, just fracturing your fibula doesn't mean you're unstable. Just fracturing your fibula and your uh, medial malus doesn't mean you're unstable. It may be unstable in your various valgus plane, but not in your uh, sagittal plane, for example. As you can see, the y-axis translation, x-axis rotation, or frontal plane, is other things that are of note. And then z-axis rotation, again, internal and external rotation, which are majority of ankle fractures occur. And uh, then you have the posture malleolus, which is on the other talk, medial malleolus, fibula, ATFL. So there's a number of things we need to think about. Next one, diagnosis. So how are you going to diagnose it? But first of all, clinical. Uh, so this paper uh, back in 1991 is what your Ottawa ankle rules are based on. This was then validated in 1993 uh, by the same group uh, in JAMA. Well, they found that the potential reduction in radiography estimated to be around about a third. You didn't need x-rays if you um, were able to use these for your diagnosis. And it was a phenomenal uh, negative to be estimated at 0%. So it was very, very accurate in doing so. So an ankle x-ray series is only required if there's pain on the malleolar zone, bone tenderness at the posterior edge of the tip of the lateral malleolus, or bone tenderness at the posterior edge of the tip of the medial malleolus, or an inability to wait, uh, wait bear both immediately and in the emergency department for four steps. It also goes into the foot, so it's a fifth metatarsal, the navicula, and the inability to bear weight immediately and the emergency uh, department for four steps again. Actually, limping is still seen as being able to bear weight. Uh, certain patients are to be uh, excluded, such as intoxicated and cooperative, distracting painful in injuries, diminished sensation in the legs, and gross swelling, which prevented your um, uh, accurate palpation. Medial tenderness is something we use to look for medial uh, ligament injury. However, this is about a 50% uh, chance of being successful. So it doesn't actually uh, include or exclude injury, but it's something you should actually note. But don't forget uh, to palpate the midfoot, the proximal fibula, fifth metatarsal base, the Achilles tendon, and one of the most misdiagnoses, the lateral tailor process. Radiographically, uh, the Laug Hansen, I'll go through this in a bit more detail. Obviously, the, the Weber classification is a very easy one. I'm not going to go through that. Um, but in regards to the Laug Hansen, uh, based on a 1949 paper, if you take from it uh, two principles. Firstly, the fractures you get is a transverse and a tension uh, force applied. In compression, you get an oblique, and that is occurs at 45 degrees to your uh, force being applied. Bending force, you'll get a butterfly, and torsional force, you'll get a spiral. So the most common type of injury is supination extirpation injury. You can see that this has a deltoid and a fibula fracture. This one has a, a oblique fracture or anticollicular fracture of the medial malleolus, and again, a spiral fracture of the fibula. 
So this is, occurs in a supinated foot, so the foot goes in that direction, and it either twists, there's a reason why you get torsional, and these can occur both through the um, bone or through the ligament. These are all torsional injuries, as you can see. A supination abduction injury. So for that to happen, uh, the foot's got to be supinated, and you're going to have tension on the lateral side. It can either be a transverse fracture of your uh, lateral side or ligaments. And then as the force is applied to your medium alveolus, at this angle, 45 degrees, you'll have a shear-type fracture. So supination abduction will uh, have a vertical medium alveolus. Supinated foot, as you can see, compression and uh, tension on the lateral side. Your pronation, it means the foot is going in the opposite direction. For them, you can either have a spiral, such as an external rotation. And as you can see on this one, pronated foot, you have a torsional injury of the fibula, torsional injury of the uh, medium alveolus, or it can be a ligamentous. And your pronation injuries, as we said before, bending force causes a, a comminution or butterfly fragment. The pronated foot, as the talus is going in this direction, then you get a bending force of the fibula and you get a pull off of the fracture or a uh, ligamentous injury on the medial side. Uh, this is something I don't use, but just for completeness sake, uh, there's a stability-based classification now in the literature uh, where they look at ones which are stable and ones which are not based on the fracture, the tailor shift, and whether or not the medial tenderness and stress test. As I said, the medial tenderness is debated and also a stress test at the moment. Uh, so um, this is why I do not use it. So my definition, the one I included in the paper earlier this year, was that uh, you can have an ankle fracture that looks unstable, but when you treat it, so put it into a neutral position and put a weight-bearing force through it or physiological stress, then it can become stable. So the stability tests that uh, are in the literature, you've got the manual stress test, so taking the patient to either doing it in uh, x-ray, which is very painful for the patient, or doing it with them under anesthetic. This is a poor standardization, and as I said, if they're not under anesthetic, it's not tolerated well. The gravity stress test was uh, very, uh, came into favor around about 10 years ago and then fell out of favor. And the reason for this, the poor standardization, because if the foot is in equinus, it will look unstable. The weight bearing radiograph has then become the mainstay over the last few years because it's a good standardization and it's the way you're going to treat the patient. So the gravity stress views, uh, this, this is a paper looking at uh, gravity stress views uh, against the weight bearing radiographs. And you can see that by doing a weight bearing radiograph, they drop the uh, numbers requiring surgery from 45% to 3.5%. And there's a reason for that. So we have this type of uh, ankle fracture. Looks relatively well uh, uh, positioned. It's a non-weight bearing view. Get on weight bearing. And we can see we have widening in the medial clear space and widening in the syndesmosis. This patient then has had a fixation, tightrope, and a deltoid repair to reconstruct that. This patient, however, it looks like it's an unstable injury. She's got widening of the medial clear space, widening the syndesmosis. Again, in the plaster, still suspicious. We get a weight bin view. You have tightening of the deltoid, the posterior deep deltoid, and the ankle normalizes. So this work is uh, uh, Michelson uh, uh, committed his entire career to uh, looking at the medial side and the importance of this. And clinical work has been uh, further put forward by Shakalari, the Guilford group. So next, the treatment. So I'm going to go through what we do for stable ankles, what we do for unstable ankles, and other nuances. So first of all, stable ankles. So there's two RCTs on this. Um, for ones that were classed as stable, they either had a walking boot or an ORIF in what we term the cross path study. It was a randomized control trial, uh, level one evidence, so a very good, well-performed randomized control trial where he had surgery. 80 had non surgery, and we also had this 276 observational cohort. And with this, surgery did not give superior in functional outcomes or complications. 
it was then based on that uh, cast versus brace. So, okay, do we have to use a cast then? And uh, it was a much smaller study with 21 in cast, 23 in brace. Functional bracing showed significant improvement in ankle range of motion and pain at six weeks, uh, but no difference at one year. And this is going to be a, a common theme that if you put someone in a plaster, you lose the initial rehab, but it does improve in time. So your unstable ankles. So this is based on your um, basic science uh, papers. So this is a paper by Ramsey and Hampton back in the 1970s, the lateral displacement by one millimeter decreased your contact area by 42%. This was repeated uh, by the Newport group uh, where they uh, revisited the concept of Taylor uh, shift and they found exactly the same. As soon as you lose that one millimeter, you can see that the contact of your tailor due to its saddle shape becomes a lot less and you get point contact and in theory arthritis. So the treatments for most of these, you either uh, fix it internally or a plaster cast. And we do not know in the age group between 18 260 of whether or not this is uh, there's any difference between these treatments. There is a trial currently ongoing. Uh, they recruit into it called the FAME trial, looking specifically at this. So, if I'm going to discuss uh, treatment, I'll discuss specifically open ductural fixation because this is what's more commonly done. So, with the fibula, we need to uh, check fibula length when we do so. So, the lateral side is commonly to fix the medial side first because this then will maintain or uh, achieve your length most commonly. Um, you might need uh, just a few millimeters rather than the uh, greater dis uh, discrepancy that you get initially if you don't fix the medial side. Uh, use the bridge plate if no interfragmentary screw possible and use lateral tailor process as a guide to fibular length. It's not always true and I'll show you uh, instances that you don't. But you can see as the fibula ascends, if the ligaments are not intact uh, on the lateral side, you will get a, um, a space between the distal end of your fibula and the lateral tailor process. And also the tubercle, so the anterior, um, the ATFL tubercle, if that ascends um, proximally, then you lose the Shenton's line. So this is an example of one that wasn't possible. This is uh, a, a fracture, very common to fibula, which has been, unfortunately, you've been fixed um, uh, too short and you can see that that tubercle so even though the lateral tailor process and the uh, fibula are in the right spot uh, both there and on the CT the tubercle have, has gone superior and therefore because the width of the tubercle is bigger than the width of the insura you will naturally get a, a lateralization of your tailors. So for this case as you can see so of the plate's been taken out and the screws. There's been a scarf osteotomy and length has been achieved. And by doing so, the tubercle now is underneath, back in the right position. So general fixation. So this is a young patient, good bone, has a clear medial and lateral uh, injury. This is what we term a Bosworth fracture because you have a, a fibula which is um, stuck in between your fibula and tibia. And this is at a straightforward interfragmentary screw neutralization plate and some medial uh, screw fixation. This one, however, with a, this amount of comminution, interfragmentary is not possible. So we looked at bridge plate these type of fractures. And as you can see, this has been bridge plated with screws above, screws below. There's also uh, been a, a screw due to the L, uh, a transtibial fixation due to the elderly patient, but we'll go through that later. Just to complete this section, um, is a lag screw required with the locking plate? So a recent RCT showed no difference um, between two groups if they are locking plate with a screw, interfragmentary or without. So if you're using a uh, um, locking plate, you don't require a uh, lag screw. The deltoid. So there's some papers uh, 20 years ago, uh, be it a, not, a, not a great paper, no power analysis, where they fixed the deltoid in a very small cohort of patients, 25 and 25, and found no difference between them uh, clinically. However, um, a retrospective uh, comparative study, uh, level three, not level two as above, which is the larger, larger patient uh, numbers, 
um, they found that if you did have a syndesmotic injury and a deltoid, you then significantly better if you had a, a deltoid repair. Now, biomechanically, this actually uh, holds true. So this is someone who's had a both disrupted, syndesmotic fixed, deltoid repaired, or both repaired. As you can see, when you get both repaired, you return to the uh, intact levels, and this is throughout the, all the different, especially internal and external rotation. So an example of this, so this is the fibula fracture. You can see widening here. This is the chap who's actually been walking on it for two weeks. Um, you fix the fibula, you've got length there. And when we stress it, we have opening on the medial side and opening the syndesmosis. Can you see the difference between that and that? So we fix the syndesmosis, and now when we open it up again, so this is one where the um, it's we're not stressing laterally. This is one where we are, and you can see that the uh, the calcaneum is swinging towards the lateral side. And the reason for that is the superficial deltoid is not uh, working, and so your uh, tight rope really between your uh, medial um, uh, medial malleolus and your sustentaculum is not there so it allows your hind foot instability so if you're planning to walk these patients early and uh, this can be a problem so i've uh, repaired this uh, superficial deltoid not the deep and now when we stress it again you can see the hind foot does not swing so this is another example of this you see with a uh, lateral stress you can see this opening up uh, medially and this hind foot instability and that can be uh, we can constitute it with a superficial deltoid repair Medium malleolus. So the AO teaching is to use two partially threaded screws to prevent rotation. These are supposed to be in a um, in a parallel fashion. Um, this doesn't hold true in literature, however. Uh, this was a paper that they looked on cadaveric uh, biomechanical study, partially threaded versus fully threaded, and found the fully threaded without the lag component had the most compression. Also, partially threaded versus fully threaded clinically, so this is a recent paper, showed that the screw loosening rates were much less for the fully threaded, and the implant related and removal uh, rates were much less for the fully threaded also. So the fully threaded uh, should be preferred to the partially threaded, uh, be it that I'm only just changing my practice on this myself. Uh, Pictanius screws, some people do Pictanius, I, uh, do this if I find the medium malleolus is uh, in a very good position after lateral uh, fixation, but there is a higher rate of non-union uh, theoretically due to uh, the, um, the periosteum being in the fracture site. So other conditions, so first of all the osteochondral lesions, um, those who scope all the ankle fractures have found that your osteochondral lesions can be as much as half of those ankle fractures. Uh, first of all, there was a very small RCT, 10 versus 9, uh, found no difference in function scores if you did scope uh, an RF. Um, but this much larger, um, uh, more successfully done RCT did show that with the arthroscopy assisted uh, open ductal fixation, you did have an improvement in your um, functional scores. And these are much uh, better in your pronation type. So I don't know whether or not this is due to the syndesmosis being fixed in a more satisfactory position. Special cases. So first of all, diabetes. Uh, so diabetes uh, are a significant problem when it comes to ankle fractures. Uh, they got experienced much greater complications. So as you can see, 26% uh, rather than 14%, specifically deep infections are much higher. And it was a significant independent predictor of worse functional outcomes. Um, if anyone wants to read further this open review um, in the EFORT uh, open review section, uh, it does go through in a lot of detail about to uh, uh, treat these. Uh, but one distinction they put into this, which I think is very important, is distinction between complicated versus uncomplicated diabetes. A data analysis, a large cohort uh, in New York found that 12% were diabetic, um, but only 1.9% of all patients with ankle fractures had um, this brittle diabetes. So a goal of treatment is uh, for these type of patients with uh, brittle diabetes is a limb salvage, 
and maintain ambulation. So we're looking for a, a maximum rigidity. This can either be achieved by a circular frame plus or minus ankle fusion, fusion with compression plates, or hind foot and nail plus or minus fusion. And we are still trying to work out what is the best way forward for these, because this is limb salvage, so you're going to have complications in every group. A diabetic patient, and as you can see, what I've done in this situation is shortened significantly to allow for easy closure of the skin. And I've done a, a primary fusion using a hind foot nail. Um, this is a, a retrograde uh, femoral nail rather than a hind foot nail specifically. And the reason for that is because a lot of the hind foot nails finish at the isthmus. And for these, you want to protect as much bone as possible. Uh, the elderly are another group. So specifically to go through this, there's a RCT called the AIM trial, uh, which was published now in 2016. All over 60, uh, 620 patients, very large pragmatic trial. Close contact group was applied in theatre and kept non weight for six weeks. And it's really important to remember this because a lot of people, are, uh, a lot of units around the country are taking it that you can put a patient in a plaster in the, in the plaster room and walk them and have the same results, which is not true. At six months, there was no difference in functional scores compared to uh, open reduction to fixation. Infection and wound breakdown were more common in surgery, which would be expected. And radiological malunion was more common in the casting group. They have uh, done a, a letter publication within JAMA as a follow-up to this, for a three-year follow-up, with now down to 450 responded. Uh, equivalent functional scores, 79.4 in surgery group and 76.3 in casting group, which are actually very good uh, functional scores for this age group and uh, equivalence in all other factors such as further procedures, fusion, arthroplasty, infection, non-union, malunion. So really there's no difference with this study between these two groups. So this is a patient, admittedly this wasn't a close contact cast, but treated in a cast, non-weight bearing, and at six weeks a unstable fracture has united and she's functioning well. And there was an editorial however in the BJJ um, on the AIM trial and there's a few questions that you need to bear in mind. The equipoison study, it was 67% excluded, most common reason being decision of the surgeon. So the surgeons were still picking and choosing and so whether or not a um, RF would be done. There's some difficulty in assessing stability, so there's certainly patients that went into this uh, study with stable ankle fractures. 24% of conversion to RF, so a quarter of those that went and you try to get them in the right position with a um, uh, with a close contact cast. Well, one quarter uh, were converted to RF, and 25% risk of non-union. But I said in this, this was from the six month, from the three year study. Actually, there's the equivalence of this now. So it's definitely a um, uh, there's a, a lot of patients that will be fine with a uh, close contact cast. But to get the, uh, the same results of the study, they have to be taken to theatre, uh, they have to be done in a certain way, and they also have to not wait there for six weeks. Um, one thing which is uh, obvious with the elderly is that they haven't got very good bone, and even with constructs such as this, uh, which haven't had uh, so it's a, a lateral locking plate, uh, two medial screws, as the patients walked, you can see this is swung. So Transtibial fixation is something I learned when I was in Newport as a common way to treat most elderly fractures of just putting in a synosmotic screw but locking it to the locking plate. The transtibial uh, in uh, the Sheffield group is an unpublished work presented to me by my colleague Mark Davis. It was presented in both last two years ago and they're still trying to get it published. But they looked at the transtibial fixation versus hind foot nail. Retrospective study and 27 patients in the medullary nail and 41 treated with uh, a transtibular fixation. They all had high FRAC scores. Our reoperation rate was significantly lower in the TTF. TTF also had significantly shorter length of hospital stay and no significant difference in superficial infection. So there's significantly more cases in non-union if you put the nail up and greater proportion return to baseline mobility if you do a transtibular fixation. So this is my go-to really fixation of a locking plate plus a locked screw called a transtibial fixation. Um, it's not only those above 60, when you get above 80, things get a lot worse, and this paper showed that um, 
for uh, over 2,000 uh, ankle fractures, there was an increase in 30-day mortality. So post-surgery, uh, the nuances of this, uh, first of all, outcomes. So there's a regression analysis, a very large paper regression analysis on um, looking at what factors uh, give you poorer outcomes. And these, what they found with uh, age, or it's to be expected, the high age group give you a um, more likely to uh, have uh, lower functional scores. Uh, smoking, history of psychiatric disease, uh, the other side being symptomatic, an open fracture, which is obvious, but this is one to really be of note. If initial and external fixation was, was the more significant uh, on univariate and multivariate analysis. Now, this could be the fact that they've had worse injuries and required the initial external fixator, uh, but we do not know. So uh, be wary of using external fixators without a need. So if you can reduce it in a plaster, then keep it in the plaster. It doesn't need an X-fix. Your rate of malreduction, uh, sorry, rate of malreduction. Uh, so this bit was actually after our group published on it, but I'd like to do this one first because it, it gives a point that this is around the country where um, with all surgeons, uh, this being a general surgical uh, procedure, being ankle fractures, uh, be done usually as the registrars cutting their teeth on uh, these such cases, but as you can see, the rate of malunion is uh, a third of patients. This is really difficult to consent a, pa a patient that they have a one in three chance of leaving theater with the ankle not where it should be. Our own paper uh, back, uh, showed uh, back in 2013 that we had a 33% malreduction rate with an additional 9% complications rate. Um, we actually went through an audit process and tried to uh, change practice within the department through education. This did not work things got worse and we actually through hard changes and moving it to um, uh, foot and ankle lists and foot and ankle clinics, uh, the amount of reduction rate got a lot better. Uh, this is back in 2016, things may have changed now. We haven't had a recent audit, but through this time we actually become a major trauma center so the complexity of the work actually got worse. Um, and we found that we were then seeing more complex injuries and rather than doing it as general lists, they were then becoming specialist lists. Does this make a difference? So we included our uh, data from the initial and the functional scores and combined this with uh, Lester, who also done a similar audit with the same results. Six year uh, clinical follow-up recorded malunions and outcomes. As you can see, Petronis is a way of measuring ankle uh, fracture malreduction. And the higher the score, the more things have been malreduced. As you can see, how the, and when that gets higher and higher, the OMAS score gets lower and lower. So your functional scores are reductions. This is also found in different types of fracture types as well. Uh, weight bearing. So there is a very big discrepancy across the country with uh, how quickly people are weight bared after surgery, for example. Uh, so this randomized control trial comparing weight bearing in boot and uh, range of motion exercises at two weeks. This is a cast and non weight bearing. And there was a significant difference in range of motion and functional scores at six weeks, but then this pitters out to 12 uh, months. You can see this difference here, but then it catches up. So for getting people back to work earlier and getting people back to sport earlier, and getting a range of motion uh, early is preferable, uh, but there's no difference in the long term. Uh, this uh, RCT comparing unprotected non-weight bearing, protected weight bearing, unprotected weight bearing, 115 randomized. They actually terminated this early because they said that they'd already found the difference. And as you can see, time to return to sports and your um, OMAS score, it was at uh, six weeks that it was found. There's a trial called the WAX trial uh, that is currently recruiting, looking specifically at this. Uh, splintage. So the next thing is okay, well, if you're going to put them you're going to take them out uh, of a plaster, can you put them into a brace? Um, so this is a brace immobilization, uh, all uh, allowed uh, weight bearing, significant difference in range of motion of muscle torque at 10 weeks. Again, same, so early uh, gains, uh, but nothing in the long term. Uh, however, this uh, RCT, which was published in JVGS, 
uh, they ha had caution on the use of uh, lateral splints and they, they found that they had a lot more infections if they used the ACAST brace. The VACACAST uh, mobilization at uh, two weeks versus plaster study, six weeks again significant uh, worse range of motion muscle group atrophy in CAST group, at 12 weeks there was no difference. This is the, a CAST boot and this is the one that we use in our department. Uh, this is a um, pilot study uh, before the A trial, which uh, showed that actually a walker boot uh, was much better at getting your pain levels down at the six weeks mark. And the A trial with the ankle injury rehabilitation is currently recruiting, looking specifically at this, or whether or not to use a cast or a brace following surgery. Rehabilitation. Um, this is the only trial that's uh, been done on this, called the exact trial. So removal of immobilization, uh, 108 at advice alone, or 106 at focus rehab, so ICC in physiotherapy, and they found no difference in functional scores at one, three, or six months. But I guess for this to be uh, successful in any department, the advice has got to be true. Thrombosis prevention. So the RCT between uh, delta par and a placebo, 136 in each arm. Um, this one actually done phlebography and was quite surprising. So this is not clinically proven, but uh, radiologically proven DVTs. We had pretty high rates, but no difference actually between if you were on a uh, low molecular weight heparin or not. And the RCT between delta power and placebo are quite large numbers uh, where they're looking at clinically important. The rates were around 1% to 2%. Again, no difference if you're on low molecular weight heparin or not. The current NICE guidelines have been changed recently, which they say consider the low molecular weight heparin uh, for people, people with lower limb immobilization whose risk of VT outweighs the risk of bleeding. So this is, they put us back in our court of whether or not we feel that the VT uh, risk outweighs the risk of bleeding. Um, just coming towards the end now, so compression stocking. This is a very interesting one because I don't know many places around the country that do this, uh, but they looked at between a tube grip and a, and a graduated compression stocking after surgery and found that the ankle circumference of the swelling and the functional scores markedly improved with the use of graduated stocking. Driving. So most of your patients will ask you, okay, doc, so can I drive yet? Uh, there's a few papers, and this is probably the, um, the most successfully done, in my opinion, where they looked at the reaction times uh, in a simulated driving and found that, as you can see here, at six weeks, you were pretty much returning to normal. So six weeks was uh, deemed as a safe time to return to driving after an ankle fracture. So to conclude, um, uh, knowledge of anatomy is extremely important. Well, with anything we do really. Think about the stability in all planes, not just the varus valgus. Not all fractures require surgery, and that is definitely true. Uh, it's trying to work out which ones would benefit, uh, the benefits outweigh the risks. If you're going to operate, then ensure you get a reduction. There's certainly uh, sort of high rates of this around the country. And uh, weight bearing and moving the ankle as soon as possible uh, gives you a, a very good uh, initial gains, although these are not kept uh, over time. <laughs>